The Orlando Magic stunned the NBA world with the first overall pick in the 2022 NBA draft. They did not take Jabari Smith as the, it had been predicted, rumored, talked about, confirmed basically for almost two full months. Uh, instead, they shock everyone and go with Paolo Bancaro out of Duke with the number one overall pick. Um, I looked just last night, I recorded a video and said, yeah, I don't think this is happening. Um, Orlando is probably trying to like bump up the value, try to maybe get something from a team like Houston. I don't know if it's the greatest smokescreen we've ever seen, or if they just didn't, you know, they just feigned interest so it would throw the other teams off, but... This is going to be a, a really interesting litmus test for the league because Paulo Banchero did not work out for the Magic at all. Not once. He postponed his meetings and workouts with them multiple times. Uh, I believe the last thing I read said that they had had a couple phone conversations and that was it. So this is like an unprecedented move where, you know, Orlando takes him anyways. There were, there were talks earlier in the week about a couple other players that were maybe trying to, you know, steer their destination as best they could. But for Orlando to bite the bullet and take him anyways, um, a lot of people thought he was going to be um, the best player available, that he is probably the most NBA ready right now. Um, compared to the other two top prospects, which were Jabari Smith and Chet Holmgren. But it's still a wild swing for Orlando. They're sitting on a absolute backlog, glut, whatever you want to call it, of players. They have, especially just in the forward positions, they have um, Franz Wagner, they have Mo Wagner, they have Mo Bamba, they have Wendell Carter, they have Jonathan Isaac when he comes back. At the guard, they have Suggs, they have Markel Fultz, they have Cole Anthony, they have RJ Hampton, and now they add in Paolo, who is, you know, best used with the ball in his hands, and steps right into that front court where I don't know what the fit's going to be really with, um, with those other guys, whoever they end up keeping, but at the end of the day, this is a win for Orlando because Paolo's arguably the best available and the best ready-to-go ready now player. It's not like the Magic were one player away from contention, but now they have a lot more of an identity because he immediately walks in and becomes the 1A option on offense for that team. No one else is really built to just be a consistent, okay, we need a bucket scorer on that roster. So this is going to be a huge step for them in forging that identity. I think they're going to go as he goes. And he was shocked. He was shocked in that interview. He was just like, I can't believe it. This is crazy. This, And who knows? This could all blow up in Orlando's face. It could become something, you know, months from now, years from now. But in, in the moment right now, it is a huge swing for Orlando, partly because it was so unexpected. Like in, in the long run, taking who you think is the best available player isn't a big swing, but with no hint at it whatsoever until last night when betting odds shifted, it's bold. It's a really bold move. Um, Chad Holmgren goes uh, number two to Oklahoma City. We will get to them. Um, Jabari Smith falls to Houston, and the Rockets fans were kind of disappointed. Like The Rockets fans seemed like they were really sold on teaming up Paolo with Jalen Green. Um, I mean, obviously, Jabari Smith, when you can draft a person at three that everyone thought was going to be the first overall pick, it's a win. Um, Houston just cleared out and traded Christian Wood, so they buy minutes for Jabari and for um, Sengun, who will play, obviously, together. Uh, Jabari is a bit more of a natural scorer. He doesn't have the handle, but Houston does have Jalen Green, Kevin Porter Jr., uh, whoever they end up getting in the trade for Eric Gordon whenever that happens. And then... Um, no, nah, probably not John Wall. It kind of seems like they're going to just, you know, buy him out or wait for some team to get desperate. So we'll leave that as it is. But Houston uh, setting themselves up nicely. They don't get the bona fide superstar in the making that, you know, Apollo would give them. So maybe Jabari's not as ready, ready made marketable. But as, as for like basketball fit, it's going to be good because Jabari is not a primary ball handler. He's, you know, more of a catch and shoot, more of a get it to him in his spots type of player. And his offensive game is smooth, might be the smoothest out of everyone in this draft. Um, 
so he's gonna he's gonna land and, and plug in just fine right away um, as for the rest of the draft I'm gonna just try to go through um, some winners and losers rather than jump back and forth across picks and all of that um, because there was a lot. I really thought this was going to be a huge trade-filled bonanza of a night. And it kind of, like, it had its moments. But there were, like, no big trades. Like, I was ready for, like, players to, like, vets to get moved around. And all sorts of movement and action and everything. And it just didn't happen. There was a lot of picks moved. There was a lot of players that were drafted and then traded. Um, so, let's get into it. The Oklahoma City Thunder. They get Chet Holmgren. Who, Chet wanted to go there. They wanted him. They have their war chest of assets. Then they go and get two more, or three more players, sorry, two more in the first round. They get Jalen Williams, the Santa Clara shooting guard. They get Peyton Watson, the forward slash wing out of UCLA. And then in the second round, they go ahead and decide to take the other Jalen Williams uh, <laughs> out of Arkansas. And they're just really, like... They're really filling their needs just really well. So Chet plugs in. Um, yes, there's all the, the thoughts about his size and his body type and if that can hold up. There's a lot of Kevin Durant comparisons that were going on even before the Thunder took him with the second overall pick in the draft. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. I mean, I don't know what like muscular Chet would look like. It's kind of like weird to think about, but... Just day one, he's going to walk into a great situation. Uh, in Gonzaga, he was not getting a ton of, you know, plays called for him. Or I should say he was, but, like, he wasn't, like, the A1 option every single night. He was on a stacked team with a lot of talent. And here, he's joining a team that, you know, probably isn't going to be a top four playoff home court advantage threat. But he's joining a roster with Shea Gilgis Alexander, Josh Giddy, Lou Dort, um, Poku, who, if if they keep him after drafting Chet, maybe there's some uh, some contention there. But this roster is is just getting, you know, not overstuffed, but it's just like, it's, there's so much depth here. It almost feels like um, Shea Gilgis-Alexander is nearing the point where he's too old to be on this team, just because of how many assets they have, how many draft picks they have. Apparently, they're all in on Victor Wembanyama next year, a.k.a. Victor Von Doom. So if they're like, hey, we're going to just let Shea tear it up until February and then shut him down again, I don't know. He could be a very um, a very coveted player going into this season and into next season. So we'll see what happens with that. But Oklahoma City Thunder is just nailing these draft picks left and right. Um, unfortunately, we do have to get to the first loser of the draft, and that is at number four, the Sacramento Kings. They take Keegan Murray, very good player. He will fit very nicely with De'Aaron Fox, Sabonis, and um, Davion Mitchell, but he would have been there. He absolutely would have been there um, a bit later in the round. There was a lot of talk of teams really trying to get that fourth pick from the Kings, to get Jaden Ivey. Um, and it just didn't happen. I mean... it It's tough. It's a tough look for Sacramento. I feel bad for the fans because on the one hand, be excited because Keegan Murray is going to step right in and fit right in with that team. But on the other hand, you could have gotten so much more. Like, they could have easily traded that pick, to, you know, moved down to six or seven, let the Pacers overpay to go get Ivy. Could have, anything. The Knicks really wanted Ivy. They could have taken a couple picks from the Knicks. And, you know, maybe Keegan Murray's still there, but they must have really loved what they saw out of Keegan Murray. And then they, in the second round, get Jaden Hardy out of the G League Ignite. Another guard. Uh, granted, not a first round pick of a guard again for the fourth straight year they do break that trend but it's just crazy to think about so the kings they drafted for, for need but they didn't maximize the pick if that makes sense so like i'm not going to sit here and say they they did terribly because they took a really good forward i'm going to sit here and say i don't like it because they could have gotten a lot more and then still gotten their guy Keegan Murray absolutely would have been there at at six 
if they had flipped with the Pacers. So, you know, what are you going to do, though? Kings are going to king. I'm sure... Um, I'm sure Keegan Murray is going to look good. Uh, Summer League is next month. I'm sure he will be good at that. I'm sure he will fit and complement well with Fox and with Sabonis. So just it's a bummer that they didn't do more because they were really in a spot where they could have, you know, they could have demanded a ransom. And instead, they just stayed pat, got who they wanted, and that was that. And that's probably, like, the most Kingsian thing <laughs> that that franchise could do. But it takes me to my next winner, because that move sets up the Detroit Pistons beautifully. If you were sitting at a table and you were running the Pistons and you said who would be the optimum choice to put next to Cade Cunningham, who absolutely came on like a menace in the second half of last season, you would probably say Jaden Ivey. <laughs> he falls to five at the pist for the Pistons. And immediately those two become one of the coolest, most exciting, must-watch backcourts, I think, going into next season. Um, it is going to create an interesting uh, dilemma for them uh, because they did take Killian Hayes a couple years ago with, I think, the seventh pick. So they're, they're kind of, you know, hitting a point where they're going to need him to do something other than play really good defense all the time. Or maybe he'll excel in a six-man role. But that's going to start to become more of a hindrance as this team expands its talent. Then they traded back into the first round uh, to get Jalen Duran, the center, after trading Jeremy Grant and clearing all this cap space for seemingly DeAndre Ayton, or like a move for someone like that. They come back and get Duran, who was one of the top center prospects in this draft, and now they immediately have you know, a, an anchor center that they can build their defense around. And they did it without really giving up too much else. Um, and that's because of the next loser to talk about, unfortunately, the New York Knicks, who just wanted to clear some cap space. They traded with the Thunder and they didn't trade... I, I don't even know how to describe it because we went like an hour and a half in real time on this draft not knowing what the Knicks were trading. So the Knicks got a bunch of second round picks in future years. They gave up all of the picks in this first round. So like they traded back, didn't take the pick, traded back, didn't take the pick, took the pick, traded the pick to other other teams and all of that it came out was for a couple second round picks and to clear Kemba Walker who goes to Detroit and immediately begins buyout negotiations with that franchise. Um, and all reports say that the Knicks are doing this in a bid to throw a max deal and make a serious run at the Mavericks guard Jalen Brunson. That's that's a, a Nixian sentence if I've ever heard one. That's tough. I feel bad for Knicks fans. Knicks fans on TV, like Stephen A. Smith, Spike Lee, they had those two poor guys sitting there waiting to react live to the pick. <sighs> just just bad. And fans online on Twitter were just so bummed. The Knicks were trending separately from the NBA draft. Never a good sign. And it just all in all feels like an odd like miscalculation and and just the, like emphasizing and focusing on the wrong things. The Knicks, you know, had some good picks in their in their lap there and they just kind of did the Knicks thing, which is expect that being the Knicks can help them get whoever they want, but in this case it's Jalen Brunson. Like there was a, a moment there where it felt like the Knicks were trying to just get first round picks so they could put a package together and go get someone like Donovan Mitchell from Utah or go get someone like um, Kyrie Irving from Brooklyn. But instead, no. They, they go um, the most unexpected route possible and decide to take, um, not even take, decide to dump uh, Kemba Walker in the hopes of getting Jalen Brunson. So we'll see. Hopefully that pays off because if they don't even end up with Jalen Brunson after all of this, it's going to be that much worse. Um, who else? The Pacers had a very good draft as well. They get Benedict Matherin. Um, he falls to them at six. Who... He's going to pair nice with Tyrese Halliburton. He is going to be perfectly complimentary. He played off ball, on ball. He was a do-it-all type of defender. And the Halliburton, similarly, is that versatile type of guard. So the Pacers and Rick Carlisle are going to be able to run 
all sorts of interesting offensive sets. This does probably mean that the team's going to even even more heavily shop Malcolm Brogdon, um, just because you want to clear playing time for these two young guys, and Brogdon's going to hold value from some team here that's looking for you know a veteran stabilizing point guard. Um, who knows what's going to happen with Miles Turner? I think if they elect to keep him, it's going to be a good fit with these two guards in the backcourt. Um, both are adept at passing. They'll be able to hit Miles Turner in his spots, get him some good easy looks um, at the rim even. Uh, so it's going to be really, really interesting. I think the Pacers, though, are just building a team of absolute dogs. All of these guys have that dog in them. Um, so we will see about that. And then the last team that I really wanted to talk about Actually, there's two more. I'm sorry. I'm trying to go quick because I don't want this to be a super long video. Two teams I really want to talk about. The San Antonio Spurs, who had a very Spursian draft. Three first-round picks, and they end up with three players that, if they play out and develop as expected, they could be sitting on a very nice core and some very strong depth in the near future. Uh, hopefully, they don't trade DeJounte Murray because... He is at the at the ringleader position, at the point guard position for them, leading this team. He is going to be perfect because he sets the table. He doesn't necessarily have to be the lead scorer every night. And now they add in Jeremy Sojan, they add in Malachi Branham, and they get Blake Wesley uh, rounding out their three picks from Notre Dame. Uh, Malachi Branham in particular is going to be a very, very... Just perfect Spurs fit. He is that lengthy defender who can hit those open shots, and he's going to plug right in next to DeJounte Murray and Keldon Johnson and Devin Vassell and Lonnie Walker and Joshua Primo, all of those guys. The Spurs team is going to be flying up and down the court, and they are going to be launching threes at probably a historic rate, if I had to guess, because this is a team of just young, exciting players they're going to be defensively just hounding teams and creating all sorts of fast break opportunities because they're going to have versatile defenders one through five. Um, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be able to switch. They'll be able to keep it up, keep up with those teams. And these picks really round out that depth to where it's never going to feel like the Spurs are like, okay, now what do we do? We have to put these guys out here for 20 minutes to get our guys some break. Like, they're going to be. Uh, absolute pain all 48 minutes no matter who is in there this is going to be a fun team to watch pop coach um, assuming he's staying with the team nothing has been said yet there's been some rumors and stuff but nothing concrete so all signs point to yes he is staying it's going to be awesome to watch him with this team because it feels a lot like the young players really kind of reinvigorated him a bit to where like he enjoys just teaching basketball more than anything now so I think the Spurs are going to be tons of fun. Not quite at the uh, level of league pass ranking that the Pistons and the Thunder are now. And then this last team that I want to talk about, the New Orleans Pelicans. They went out and had themselves a draft. They get Dyson Daniels to shore up their second guard position. He can also ball handle as well. Uh, so he will pair very well with C.J. McCollum in that backcourt. Um, Div Devontae Graham was very good for them this year. I think he gives them a little bit more in terms of playmaking ability and defensively than uh, Devontae, but who knows? I'm sure it's going to be a slow process getting him acclimated. And then in the second round, an absolute steal for the Pelicans because he was projected to be a first-round pick. E.J. Liddell from Ohio State is going to join that front court. And if Zion is in as much, you know, as a good a shape as the pictures seem to suggest he is, this team is going to be a defensive wagon with Valanchunas, Zion, Ingram, EJ Liddell. It's that front court is going to be hard to score on if they are if they are all healthy and if EJ can translate his game like it was at Ohio State to a pro level. It's going to be very nice. I think getting him in the second round is an absolute steal. He was projected to go like 20, 20, 22, 25, somewhere in that area. So falling all the way to the 11th pick of round two. I don't know if that's a red flag type thing. But either way, it's the Pelicans gain. They finally have a clear direction. It seems Zion's fully on board with the team as well. 
And that's probably the biggest direction you can get <laughs> is having that vote of confidence from him. So we will see what they look like. But after how well they they played and looked in the playoffs this last year, granted they got eliminated by the Suns, but they certainly put some teams and some fans on notice. They did absolutely everything they needed to to address their next issues and to take that next step. So if everyone stays healthy and everything like that, I think this team could be a huge shock for some teams out in the West. And I think that's everything. Um, please let me know in the comments your thoughts on the draft. If there was a player or a move that you really enjoyed or something that you were disappointed by or surprised by, let me know. And we'll see what happens with the rest of the moves and trades and stuff because now it kind of feels like we'll see things start to pick up in terms of veteran movement. Hopefully, I could just be talking. Who knows? So, so we'll see what happens. We'll keep it tuned here. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, enjoy the weekend. And I will be back.